Welcome to Sasin. Thank you. It's great Thank to have you. you. Um, really honored. Uh, looking forward to this discussion because it's on a topic I never would have thought about having a podcast on. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Tiparat Chotibut. Uh, he is a theoretical and computational physicist at uh, Chulong University, the university over here. Uh, he's the co-founder of Quantum Technology Foundation of Thailand, which is a consulting firm that promotes STEM research based on uh, the various needs of society. So hopefully you're doing some good work there. Um, you've earned your master's and doctor degrees uh, in theoretical physics from Harvard University, both master's and, and the doctorate. Yes, correct. And uh, your current work focuses on the relationship between computer science, physics, and biology, and uh, I guess uh, sort of as the umbrella area of quantum computing, right? Correct. And we'll talk about that and just sure. try to figure out what that right. means. Uh, but it's, you know, it's one of the most um, exciting fields in the world today that nobody understands. <laughs> Including me. Certainly. <laughs> well, you know, I was looking at the list of your papers and some of the more recent ones, uh, they sounded very exciting, right? Follow the regularized leader routes to chaos in routing games. <laughs> Quantum diffusion map for nonlinear dimensionality reduction. I'm sure that was a very popular one. And my, my favorite one was... Uh, an explainable self-attention deep neural network for detecting mild cognitive impairment using multi-input digital drawing tasks. I'm sure Hollywood's that's already the, knocking on your yeah, door. I think that's <laughs> the longest title ever <laughs> I ever had, I think. <laughs> Collaboration well, with July Medical School. But I guess uh, what it means is that you've deeply thought about these things yes. and uh, researched it and uh, but I've also seen that you've done presentations to to uh, to uh, groups of people that are not do not have a, a grounding in physics. So that's why we're asking you to join us to sort of uh, to be able to explain this really exciting field, and it is an exciting field in layman's terms. Um, uh, we'll we'll have to learn a little physics uh, going along the way, I think, but. Uh, you know, why don't we start there? So sure, I'll try. That's <laughs> a very nice introduction, and thanks for having me. Well, it's great to have you here. Um, so, explain quantum computing in layman's terms. I mean, you know, how, how does it differ from classical computing? Classical computing meaning what we have in our PC, and also what actually AI is using uh, to advance uh, science currently. Uh, you know, things like what's a what's a qubit. And, you know, how does it contribute to the power of quantum computing? So, you know, in your words, what, what is this? Yeah, so maybe I'll break down quantum computing into two terms. One quantum and the other one is computing. Oh, okay. Let's start from the easier one, Chris. It's computing, right? <laughs> yeah, our current technology, including almost any information processing system, is based on standard bit formulation. Mm -hmm. So the fundamental building block of computation is a bit. So the most fundamental unit is either a zero or one, but cannot be both right. at the same time. And now when we talk about quantum, there's this strange property called superposition. Uh, a quantum particle can be in multiple states at the same time. If you have two state system, then you can be in both state zero and state one at the same time. And as a result, people have thought about why don't we just replace a bit, which can be just one of the two, but not both with the qubit, which can be any of the combination of those. Mm. So the fundamental unit will have a more information and storage processing capability. Mm. Now imagine if you have two qubits rather than two bits. Two bits, you can have four possible states, right? Zero, 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 one, mm. one, zero, or one, one. But with two qubits, there are much, much more uh, combination that you can explore at the same time, not just one out of the four, but four out of the four. Okay, that is I think time, so even more. This is a, a real right. challenge. So how do we make right. it? Like I was just thinking when you were talking about zero one, right? So like this pen, it's on zero. Now it's on one. Yeah, right. That's a very good analogy. But what's the equivalent in quantum computing? Yeah, the, the it's analogy. both on and off. It, it's also yeah. the the tip is about out and in at the same time. Correct. So one way people like so that doesn't that blow people's minds. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> it does. It does. Uh, it is a very strange property of quantum nature. 
in which when you look at the quantum state, let's say, suppose you have only the state of uh, the, the, the height of the pencil to be on the table or off the table, mm. then usually you just think of it. If the, if, if, the, if the tip of the pencil is on the table, then it's one state. If it's not on the table, then that's the other state. Right. But, but in a quantum world, you cannot think of it that way because then the position of the tip of the head is not actually well defined. The best way we explain this is, is somewhere around there. And because it's somewhere around there, the, the best way to explain this is there are probability to be in many places at the same time. Mm. And we have a mathematical description to explain this kind of multiple superposition of many things to be in the same place at the same time. So a classical computer cannot... So this is, so this is grounded in sort of the... Even a layperson like me has, probably, has heard of the idea of quantum physics being uh, sort of out of our reality at, at these tiny, right. tiny level, this atomic, subatomic level, something can be two things at the same time, right? Yeah, and so, so even more than two things. Even more than two things, and especially so. But the one thing that I've heard is that you could be both, it could be at the subatomic level, something can be both a particle and a wave at the same time. So I don't know what that really means, but I do know it, what it means is that it's a different way of existing, Correct. right? So what you're saying is in uh, classical computing, you, everything is separate. It's zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. But uh, something that can be multiple things at the same time is really hard to understand. You know, I mean, are there any examples that you could think of also to help us understand what it means to be multiple things at the same time? Yeah, so if you dig down to the fundamental level, it's very difficult to imagine, right? The equivalent of having, say, suppose you have a, uh, a coin and you want to toss a coin, right? Either it lands heads or okay. tail. Qubit is very similar, except that before you start to measure it, it's kind of spinning coin before it lands on a table. Okay. But then you can assign a probability of whether it will be in zero more or it will be in one more. And a quantum quantum state, you actually need to prescribe the probability of being in zero and one when you observe it. That's why people like to say it is a superposition of both zero and one at the same time, unless you start to measure it. And then people say this jargon all the time, the probability collapse into one of the possible states. So that's how quantum nature works. If you go into subatomic particle, this theory has been theorized and hypothesized for a hundred years mm. and it has never been wrong. So at a subatomic level, this is how nature really works. Right. But it's not how our intuition works because in our world, we always observe things. We do not have to think about the state of knowledge of quantum particles. Whenever we see something, the quantum state already collapsed. But in fact, to explain it clearly, you totally need to prescribe a problem of probability of it to be in multiple states, and that we call the superposition of being in many states at the same time. So is it, is it that quantum computing is more efficient in certain cases when you're dealing with certain high levels of problems of high levels of complexity, like you're talking about nature, right? Uh, weather systems, uh, or probably creating new materials, chemical makeup or uh, right. material ma makeup of, of certain materials or new materials. Right. Um, so weather patterns, uh, disease, uh, finding cures for diseases. So very complex things that we have trouble understanding today with today's comp computational power. The quantum computing uh, process or system mm, is going to more efficiently understand those type of things. Is that a way to think it, about it? Yeah, that's a very good question. That probably is what many people are questioning as well. What is quantum computer good for? Um, I would like to explain it this way, is that if you want to explain certain phenomena better, then certainly there'll be a way that sometimes you don't even need a computation to explain the phenomena, but somehow you want to make computer to simulate those phenomena in order to gain certain knowledge of the future. One classic example, this is not related to quantum computing yet, but I'll, I'll come back to quantum computing later, is that, for example, if you want to uh, create a phenomenon of avalanche, mm. right? What is avalanche? Avalanche is a lot of snow particles 
more than 10 to the 23 particles is too many particles. Mm. And by classical physics, you can actually simulate how each particle would move and collide with each other. Mm. If you have a commuter that is very powerful enough, then you can simulate how each particle would move. You can predict with this much force how it will landslide. Does it cause avalanche and how does the avalanche look like? Mm. And as a result, Pixar make uh, a lot of uh, investment into creating the visual simulation of real-world physical phenomena. Mm. And these classical real-world phenomena now can be easily simulated because the rules that govern how these many particles interact are not too complex, yet you still need a very powerful computer to simulate this phenomena. Mm. However, if you look into the quantum nature of the universe, then the mathematical rules describing this quantum world are very inefficient to be able to simulate by classical computer. Mm. So Richard Feynman said, if you want to understand how quantum world works, chemistry, for example, when you have multiple atoms collide with each other, that's its form of new molecules, is the molecule going to be useful for drug development? Is it going to bind to virus? These questions is very difficult to be simulated by a classical computer because inherently it's quantum in nature. Mm -hmm. One of the holy grail that people are looking into and many researchers are looking into right now is can you simulate quantum chemistry? Mm -hmm. For example, if you mix multiple reactants together, in the past, chemists and other biologists would have to go to the lab, perform experiments, control pressure at high temperature or low, depending on the system, and see whether or not the chemical compounds that come out of these reactions is the one they like. For example, they want to create the COVID uh, virus vaccine, for example. Mm. Uh, although people know how to create certain shape, not, not know how to create certain shape, know what kind of shape yeah. is important to bind to COVID virus. Mm they cannot create specific protein or, mm. or cure that, that can bind to the virus because we don't have the predictive power from computation to know in advance if you mix certain chemicals, whether or not the resulting molecules can bind to virus. That's why a lot of investment in pharmaceutical company goes to waste because it's mm. trials and errors. We just try possible combinations that we know how to create and see whether the resulting chemicals can bind to virus and kill them. So it's interesting because in the past few years with the advances of AI, the layperson, it's like, wow, a AI helped us uh, deal with uh, the COVID uh, crisis with creating new vaccines or, uh, you know, deep minds, deep fold was able to figure out protein folding, which they said that was really hard to do uh, in the traditional methods. And so tr classical computing has been able to solve those type issues and make those advances. But what you're saying is that actually in those areas, there's still so much more that we exactly. don't understand and exactly. classical computing is not going to get us there. So, so back to the question that you asked before, is it more powerful? Yes, in specific sense, if you want to simulate quantum phenomena, and some of which are extremely crucial for our current modern industry, you know, namely a pharmaceutical company, um, maybe chemistry, uh, other products that use a lot of chemical compounds, this knowledge to create molecules, you inherently requires how to simulate quantum phenomena, which is what quantum computer is hopeful, hopefully you will be useful. What are, what are, I mean, you, you sort of hinted at some applications, but, uh, you know, off the top of your head, you know, if quantum computing is able to advance, uh, at a, at a, at the rapid clip, it seems to be advancing. In the next 10 to 20 years, what, what, what do people hope will be an outcome? In, for, let's just say pharma, uh, chemicals and right. drugs. What, 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 are, what are some of the things right. people are imagining? Right, so, so those chemical simulations, they definitely will reduce a lot of cost for try, trials and errors, perhaps 80% or 90% rather than go into the lab and try everything and then waste money because you learn. And these are simulations that are done? Well, yeah. this is actually, actually real-world uh, okay. chemical mixing oh, chamber okay. that they do. Um, so they waste a lot of money on these substrate, right. substrates and reactants to try to see whether or not it works, the formula works or not. Uh, but so imagine... They're, they're just guessing. I mean, they're guessing. making very educated guesses, but they're correct. guessing. Correct, correct. 
suppose we have a better guess by using quantum computer to gain this knowledge, mm. then we don't need to waste a lot of money, mm. trials, trials and errors in the experimental lab, and hopefully have a more uh, informed way to create the compounds that we like. So certainly, many people hope that we will be able to develop drugs much faster at a much uh, safer cost. One fact that I learned that was quite interesting is that, you know, in order to create fertilizer to support the world farmer and growing meat for foods, right? Mm. Human needs to take about 1% to 2% of energy consumption to create fertilizer. This is over all the energy consumption in the world. We spend 2% on creating fertilizer. Well, the reason is because we don't have a better formula rather than mixing chemicals in extremely high temperature, extremely high pressure to create nitrogen and whatever necessary for plants to grow. Mm. And, and imagine we have this knowledge, right? We can save a lot of energy, especially like this green, green era, right? Green policy or whatever. So people think that a lot of uh, useful compounds, chemical mostly, um, can be created uh, much more efficiently with this potentially powerful knowledge that we can gain from quantum simulation. So it's not just about create, being more productive about creating uh, food, it's about decreasing the cost of uh, the, the energy consumption. Yes. Alone, just, just trying to figure that one out, you, you kill two birds with one stone. Yeah, so, so this comes from being, being able to see in advance what kind of chemical compounds you get. So you gain this special knowledge about how to create useful compounds mm -hmm. and chemical compounds are everywhere. Chemical engineering department, they have all this specialized way to create certain things, but still it's not very from computational perspective, which we can simulate hopefully with quantum computer. So whatever relates to chemistry or pharmacy, uh, many people believe that this industry will be revolutionized. So are big ag, are they investing money in quantum computing to figure, I mean, if you just say what you just said, yes. fertilize, creating a more efficient fertilizer production process will decrease the 2% of energy consumption we're yes. doing down to, if we have it, that yes. is a incredible savings across the board. Yes. Uh, it seems like a high leverage thing to invest in for governments and for exactly. and big ag. So are they doing that? So are they, are they connecting to QC? Uh, con quantum computing labs to try to figure that out. Yeah, that's the end goal. So that's that why um, five years ago, uh, many research scientists used this as an agenda to develop quantum computer. Mm. But currently, we still think it's still far too ahead of time mm. until we have a full-scale quantum computer that can simulate that because we can go into the detail later. Well, we'll, we'll go simulate. back to that later. But yeah, but, but last it week, I just met a challenge. Yes, yes. Um, a new spore institute in Denmark. A um, new has sport? New spore? The oh, new founding father. Oh, Niels Bohr. Niels Bohr. The physicist, yes. Yes. The founding father of quantum mechanics. Uh, they have partnership with Nova Nordisk, which is one of the larger pharmaceutical company. Uh, Nova Nordisk will build one building and, and dedicate for quantum computing for life science especially on simulating these drugs and then whether or not you can find a new way to, to create drugs and then and chemicals that are useful. So it's exciting in many places and, and, and in places where drugs development mm. are very important, they, they have these quantum units already. So obviously there's a profit motive behind all of that. Uh, okay. So pharma, what, where else? Pharma, big, big ag, where, where else is like, thinking, wow, in finance. 10 to 20 years, if we can figure it out, finance. So, yes. so crypto. So, so crypto, we can talk about that later, but finance in terms of optimization. So other areas such as optimization, uh, because people believe that with quantum computer, due to this superposition of existing in multiple states at the same time, there might be a clever way to explore all possible solutions and find the right solution faster than usual. So, Optimization is where to invest, how to invest. Whenever you have a, a variable that you want to, to tune and then whatever you need to pay or the cost is minimum. Um, the easiest example is that suppose I have to tell mailmen of Thai Post to send mails to all the uh, people that need to receive the mail within today, but I have only 50 bikers what are the best route plans for each of them so that 
uh, they can send the places to the places save minimum cost, mm. and also people get what they want, right? Can can classical computing do that well? No, oh, it's very difficult. Oh, it, how, why is it so difficult? Now, imagine if you have um, just two routes to choose from. Right. Then there are two possibilities that you can go through. You go to the first one first, or you go to the other one first, right? And then that's, that's the end of the computation. Suppose you have four roads that you can go through. It's four times three times two way to okay. organize. So you can see how, how big the number yes, can get. solution can scale. Right. If you get up to 100 destinations you can go to, this is the well-known uh, traveling salesman problem. Right. Computer science, you have thought about it, and they have proven that uh, classically it, it's, it's impossible at this point. There's no solution. But classical computer can find the best optimal route uh, when you have a large number of places to go. Okay. So when I look on Google Maps and I want to go to this place, it's a fairly simple calculation because I'm just saying point A to point B. Correct. But if I was trying, it won't allow me to ask, but if I were trying to put in point A to B to A, A to G, but yeah. through five different places, right, it becomes very complex. It become extremely complex. In this case, the number of solution, you grow what we call exponentially with the number of road. So if, if you have, uh, let's say for the simplest case, you have about 10 roads to go through. Then it roughly has about 1,000 something combination you need to go through. But if you have 20, then it's a million combination. If you have 100, then the number of the road that you have to go through exceeds the number of the, the atom in the universe already. So if you just count how many solutions there are, it's virtually impossible for any classical computer to try all of them. Mm -hmm. you have a extremely large computer. And then back to this quantum bit mm -hmm. part, because of this superposition, suppose you have the best classical computer now, say the size of this building, right? It can solve one problem. And then let's say you want to solve a harder problem that the problem also scale exponentially with the system size. Say you add one more road into it, then you need twice as much mm. of the current computational power to find best solution, which means you need to build another building, mm. right? That's why optimization is one of the holy grail. Can we use this quantum superposition to do many things at the same time to do something clever and then we get the right solution now? And designing the algorithm to be able to do that is very difficult. And people have invested a lot of time and effort doing research in that. Uh, for example, JP Morgan now has the quantum computing uh, portfolio optimization team because portfolio optimization is finding the best solution. And, and classically, there are certain mathematical problems that's very hard to solve. Mm. Uh, this quantum team proposed certain quantum algorithm. Using this superposition, you can potentially get the solution faster. So that's one uh, investment that goes into quantum and relates to useful so then result. Are, are bankers, financial, you know, hedge fund owners, like super rich hedge fund, or those type of places could probably invest in quantum computing time. Yes. What are they putting into the algorithm? They're, they're right. It, it, it seems to be, it would have to be very complex. It could yeah. include things like weather patterns. It could include things like probability of, of uh, geopolitical conflict. It, 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 would it? I mean, I'm trying to think. How, what are these? How are these guys programming? Yeah. So in the end, how are they thinking about it? In the end, it's all mathematics. Um, you cannot optimize without have a well-defined mathematical framework. Right. So different industry we have different mathematical optimization problem they need to solve. Those who want to send mail men to the destination, we have different mathematical problems from so how the particular optimization solve them. But eventually it boils down to, you have so many variables, so many combinations that it could be. You cannot use the classical to go one by one and evaluate each option individually because it's too slow. And sometimes you need to make a decision within half a day because your competitor is, is getting ahead of you. Uh, then once you get that mathematical optimization essence out, um, you basically think about how would you use quantum computer to solve those problems. Mm. And these optimization problems sometimes are very challenging. There's no actual proof yet that quantum would be able to solve better, for example, in traveling salesmen. But there's been some heuristic to show that you can use certain quantum system to get 
a good solution out of it. And then people are investing a lot of time and effort in that direction because they believe this, there must be a clever way to make use of this superposition and being in multiple places or states at the same time. Are, are those groups like hiring physicists? Well, actually, financial service is famous for hiring physicists. Uh, I, I imagine you've been recruited at some point <laughs> in your life, but uh, do they do they actually hire people who understand quantum physics? Yes, they do. Actually, my, my friend who was a faculty member in U.S. physics uh, got hired out of the faculty member position to to do quantum computing and J.P. Morgan and a lot of people who work on quantum encryption, which we haven't touched upon, but also another important aspect of why we need to invest in quantum and cybersecurity, they are also hired into this big company mm. as well. Yes. So before we go into how difficult it is actually to do quantum computing from an operational perspective, let's talk about uh, you know blockchain and and crypto, which of course is you know is considered the I guess the highest level of security that exists today, right? Right, and uh, that's why some people feel that you know cryptocurrency is the future, blockchain is the future. But my understanding is that quantum computing, once we figure out how to think about it, it could easily solve how to break blockchain's uh, cryptology very quickly. Yeah, which is a huge threat to all the people who thought they were highly protecting their assets. Yeah, historically, it's very interesting uh, because in 1980s, there's this famous professor in electrical engineering, Peter Shaw from MIT. He proposed that if you can manipulate certain rules of quantum mechanics, such as particle wave duality and uh, superposition entanglement, then you can use Charles algorithm, now the name of the algorithm, to, to factorize the RSA encryption code mm. in exponentially faster time, rather than taking two years to hold in on hacking one password RSA encryption, you can potentially hack it within a week or two. Mm. Uh, with this Shaw algorithm, given that there's a quantum computer that works, uh, which means that when human can build a quantum computer that operates according to Peter Shaw's assumption, you'll be able to hack the current right. password right. if it hasn't been protected by the quantum encryption protocol already. Mm. So Facebook, Google, password, we can be easily hacked with the advent of the real quantum computer that is useful enough. Uh, that's one threat that mm that many uh, countries have invested into how to prevent this quantum uh, hacking mm -hmm. or even just to build one to hack other countries. Right. There's been a lot of uh, confidential military investment as well. Um, so with this chart algorithm, we know the potential of quantum computer to make the current cybersecurity system to be unsecured, right? And the blockchain is one of the... Uh, secured uh, protocol. That's that's the easiest well, yeah. way they, they know how to explain it, right? It, you, you, you can trust it. You know it's secure. Uh, everything that goes into the system is open and it's, it's, it's public. And now another technology comes along saying it's no longer safe or it won't be safe. Yeah, so, so the main security idea behind the blockchain is that you have a chain of blocks. Right. If, if you want to make the whole information to be uh, unsecured or insecure, you have to hack the whole chain. Right. So imagine if you have just one link of the chain, it is difficult. Right. Then hacking the whole chain is exponentially more difficult. And that right. chain is dispersed across exactly a, a, a wide variety of computers on, yep. on a pure network. Correct. Uh, at this point, uh, as a quantum physicist, we don't actually know when the quantum computer will be able to very quickly hack a single chain link. Mm. But imagine one day you have a quantum computer that is strong enough, powerful enough. Hacking one chain could take could take maybe one second. One link could take one second. Mm. So hacking one chain, just suppose you have ten thousand chain uh, link, it's just ten thousand times. Right. At least a matter or so. It's for a short amount right. of time. So that could be insecure. People have thought about how to deploy quantum secure blockchain security system as well. Just replace the standard RSA encryption in each link by the what we call, for example, post-quantum cryptography. There's a protocol in which it's secured under quantum algorithm. We have thought about that. There's a Google has recently announced that they will adopt this uh, post-quantum cryptography protocol. Mm. So if certain countries has quantum computer that is operating, 
and they cannot hack Google, for example. Uh, for Can example, you try to describe what they, they, they're really cool looking, but how would you describe what those IBM and Google QC computers uh, look like? They're so yeah. So what you see in the picture, uh, the golden octopus leg, yes, and the goals, uh, in fact, is not quantum computer. That's the fridge. It's the casing. Oh, it's the fridge. It, just to make the tiny chip consisting of the uh, quantum computing superconducting. Wait, wait. So the quantum computer is just the, this tiny little thing? This tiny. That's how information processing happen this size. <laughs> but the big giant thing is to make... What, is that, what is that chip made of? How... how, how well, how it, yeah, that's gonna be it's a hard thing. <laughs> but but you can imagine it's it's a way to control electricity flow okay. that can be in two states at the same time. Okay. And that's represent qubit because it can be in both on and off at the same time. And this electricity flow has to interact with other flows so the qubits can talk to each other. It's a chip. Is it a little it's box? A chip. Is it it's a... it's it's a chip, very thin chip. Uh, I think the thickness is about the size of your fingernail thickness. There's no cat in it. That, that's no. There's no Schrodinger's cat. <laughs> it's a not chip. yet. It's a chip. It's a chip. <laughs> so, who makes the chip? IBM makes their own chip, and Google makes Google their own chip. Their own chip. Yeah. Originally, it, it was from Yale's team, uh, Yale University, and then people realized that if you have a lot of money, maybe you can scale up. You can make blue bits in this chip talk to each other. For example, that's one of the possible hardware. Hard to imagine because kind of like you have the state of electricity flow on and off to interact with each other. It's uh, mind blowing to imagine how. Wait, wait. So when you talk about qubits before and, and multiple qubits, and it's all, if you have, so in that single chip, you've got multiple qubits entangling with each other. Correct. Correct. Not all of them are entangling with each other, but those that are nearby each other will be entangled with each other. So engineering the quantum chip so that one qubit can entangle as many qubits as possible. It's one of the engineering challenges. So let's talk about the engineering challenges because clearly all the things that we talked about in pharma, financial services is, is not happening yet because it's actually not easy to complete a, an operation with a, Q, a quantum computer, right? I, I, I understand that Conditions have to be very precise. It, it's easy for it to go wrong, whether it's, I don't know, temperature or, or movement or all sorts of conditions have to be right. right right now to make it work. And so their failure is more common in exactly. trying to make a computation than anything else. And that's sort of the op engineering problem that we have with quantum computing. Is that Can you explain that a bit? I'm just making it up right now. Yeah. So... As we probably know, we rarely see any quantum phenomena in the real world. Mm. But quantum computer harness this very fragile quantum phenomena to do computation. And as a result, it's already very difficult to be able to control and manipulate this information processing system, unlike your transistor, which doesn't require much of the quantum phenomena that is very fragile. Uh, but superposition and entanglement is very fragile. And due to what I told you earlier on the, when you start to look at quantum system, you start to interfere with it, then it collapsed. Whenever you want to make information processing, sometimes you need to have environment to manipulate your qubit operation. Mm -hmm. But when it has interaction with environment, then it starts to lose quantumness in a technical term called decoherence. Mm -hmm. The qubit really decoheres. And, and it, one of the main challenges now is to extend the decoherence time to as long as possible so that it can operate uh, to as much time as we, as we like before it decoheres. Oh, and long. how long is that period of time today? Millisecond. Oh, millisecond. <laughs> yes, yes. So, you know, in the old days when you wanted to get computing time, you have to wait for it and then you get a few hours on it. But now you're yeah. just saying it's, it's milliseconds. Right. So that this that it involves that. We don't know how well our engineering uh, thought could be uh, in order to extend this the coherence time to as long as possible. But with millisecond, it's it's already very good because usually if you have qubit to interact with the environment, nanoseconds, like a million times, much smaller than millisecond, then you already decohere. But now you can go up to like one million time factor of the natural decoherence time, which is pretty good. Um, people have this proposal 
why don't you extract certain information now at the end of the recurrence time to the classical computer? Because you can store your computer hard drive to as long as you like, as long as there's no uh, crazy magnetic So basically it. transfer the data from the quantum computing to the classical computer to continue. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, you, you do the bulk of the, the hard labor inside the quantum computing and then you pass it off to the it's kind of like classical. You, you put safe into the classical information okay. right. and then feed back this information and restart okay. the quantum computation again. Eventually, it would decohere, but at the end of the decoherence time, you extract information now, feed it back so that you can perform useful quantum simulation and computation. How, how often can you get time. these millisecond computational uh, acts of, of computation in the quantum computing? Is it do you have to wait a long time, or is it? It just happens. Rest, it restart, can restart very quickly. Restart is almost instantaneous. Oh, okay. Yeah. It is okay. a conducting qubit, for example. Okay. Well, then you could set up a, a process where there's feedback yeah. in between yeah. a classical computer and a yeah. quantum computer. Yeah, it's called a hybrid, uh, high classical quantum. quantum. Yeah. Yes. And then um, IBM Q has has shown that with this hybrid classical quantum, you can build a quantum algorithm to simulate quantum chemistry. I see. Now, are you or your consulting firm doing any work on quantum computers? So, uh, because quantum computer now is still too small to solve real, actual, practical problems. Oh, I see. So it's just, it's not, it's sort of at an infant level at this stage. You can't really solve the type of problems we were talking about yet. Mm, not yet with the standard uh, quantum computer like IBM Q or quantum, uh, Google quantum. Um, but I think the important point is that not to solve now, but to formulate a problem now. So, uh, because once you know that your industry can have the mathematical or difficult optimization problem that can be solved better with quantum computer, mm. then you probably need to find one so that one day when Google successfully build a quantum computer, you go open access. You just press green button and operate that unit, and then you don't have the the lag behind your competitors. So what are the type of algorithms you're trying to formulate to solve what problem? Yes. So uh, when you, you probably don't want to disclose uh, uh, clients, but um, generally speaking, generally what optimization, of uh, what is the best way to send uh, send mails, save costs of the routing okay. for, for cars, or uh, for example, we work with KBTG. Um, trying to find an algorithm for loan collection optimization. How do bank get the loan most collection. loan and at the same time, make sure that the welfare of the, uh, the clients are preserved. Mm. I see. And then, so hopefully you'll be ready when quantum computers, computing is ready and uh, be able to provide uh, solutions for your clients. Uh, right. So a lot of people, even though they know that Maybe in the next two or three years, there won't be a useful or faltering quantum computer that is good enough to solve optimization problem. Mm. But many companies that have a lot of investment money, they start this small quantum unit so that they can formulate the problem within their organization and they know exactly what to do when mm. there is an actual useful quantum computer. Is it, is it meaningful for a country like Thailand to have the resources to have its own quantum computer? I don't think it is useful because now no one actually knows which platform or hardware would scale. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have infinite money mm -hmm. and you probably need to spend it wisely, mm -hmm. but it is useful to think about how we can use quantum computer. Suppose somewhere in the world, some, someone invents a quantum computer that is useful tomorrow. Mm -hmm. What can we do with it? Thinking about algorithm is the safest way to make sure that you can think and do research without spending too much money. Right. Think on something that might not work. For example, now there are at least three major hardware for quantum computing to build quantum bits. Like IBM and Google, they use superconducting qubit. IonQ uh, in the S&P 500 already, IPO. They use ion trap. They, they shoot laser to 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 cage the atoms and mm. manipulate these atoms on an ion. So it's all called ion Q. Mm. So it's not a chip. It's not a chip. It's kind of a, chamber, a reaction. chamber. And okay. then they place atoms on different grids and then they talk to each other. Uh, so uh, originally it was from the University of Maryland. 
uh, many people can manipulate those in Germany it has very good uh, bio and trap system, for example. And uh, another one by Microsoft, they propose a very peculiar property is a quantum world that tend to be prone, less prone to noise, could, called Majorana qubit, for example, and people are looking into that. Australia has another hardware, so now this is the fourth one, um, silicon-based. So people are excited about this because um, around the world, there are so, so, so many materials that can build silicons. It's amazing if you think about it, right? Because we talked about like some of the biggest implications for pharma, financial services, crypto, and, and cryptography. And now you have this sort of wild race around the world to find out what's the best way to, to build a quantum computer. You've just mentioned at least four different countries that are involved. There are probably others, wherever the funding is, they can, they can do it. They China can has the biggest investment. Yeah, I would imagine, right? Yes. And so is there a clear leader? Um, later in terms of investment, China, number one, the U.S., number two, mm. and then European Union as a whole, number three, and Southeast Asia, of course, Singapore has the biggest lead. Yeah. Um, but in terms of which one would take over, no one really knows at this point because of these engineering challenges. You don't know how to control the interaction with the environment too well, even in a signal system. We don't know whether a silicon system is easier to do that. Uh, to be able to do that than the Google team or no one else at this point. It's a very exciting time for scientists. <laughs> and and you th the, the first breakthrough application will probably be in the chemical world, um, like drugs or new materials. That could be one of the uh, directions, many investment into that area. For example, South Korea does its... Uh, QNOVA company that was funded heavily by, by the government to develop this uh, quantum optimization for chemicals. And there are many chemical companies around the world are popping up, although they haven't made any money yet at this point, because as I say, there's no actual quantum computer that, that works for large molecules. But people have thought about what could you do with it. Um, but that would be uh, the main impact for sure. If, you can be a useful computer. It's pretty interesting, right? Because even in the classical computing age today, uh, the fight over semiconductors has has become, you know, made has created geopolitical conflict. And uh, now that you, and maybe it's a good thing that the the race for quantum computing is spread out, and hopefully that it advances evenly across. But hmm. you know, you sort of wonder what happens if one company or one uh, e economy or government advances at a far greater clip than others, it, it's yeah. a, it could be a significant advantage. Yeah, I think this geopolitical or scientifically political arena uh, very interesting. Recently, there was this case that Chinese students who want to pursue a PhD in quantum computation with the best quantum computer scientist in the world in UT Austin, uh, that student got accepted to the PhD program, but the visa got rejected because it's, they don't want Chinese students to learn about quantum computer from the best wow. people in the world in the US. <laughs> so it's getting very intense. Uh, partially, I think the main reason is because of cybersecurity. Whatever country has it first, they can hack other countries. Six, right? Exactly. Right. So are, are, then, are huge budgets coming from defense departments around? Yes. The yes, that's correct. Um, I have heard that uh, in the UK and in Russia, the government has already uh, deployed this post-quantum cryptography protocol already. And they want to make one step more secure, which make the line between important uh, minister to be quantum secure. So they'll build a quantum communication network that no one will be able to hack so that the information transfer through their quantum wire is 100% uh, secured. Wow. Yes. Is, and what is the relationship between quantum computing and AI, which is on classical computing? Is, is quantum computing potentially an accelerant to the advancement of AI? Yeah, or an AGI. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's very interesting because AI now is already very smart, very yeah. good. 
what can it be better, right? <laughs> can it actually be better? That's the question. Um, one thing that AI is still slow now, when you train an AI, it costs so much energy, it costs so much computational time mm. to be able to create, for example, large language model like ChatGPT, the biggest energy hogs or, or data centers driving AR algorithms, right? right? <laughs> so, so quantum scientists were hoping that with quantum computer, there could be an alternative way to create the maybe as, as clever AI, but with a much less energy cost, right? Because of this powerful quantum and computational processing, you, wow. you may be able to create an AI at a much safer cost of energy, for example, no carbon footprint as much, which means they can spend more and then the things can advance faster, <laughs> hopefully. It doesn't mean they spend less, it just means they'll, yeah, but, but it's, <laughs> they can do more with less. Yeah, it's, it's a very exciting idea. Actually, I'm, I'm doing research focusing on this quantum artificial intelligence direction. People around the world are trying to think if you have a useful quantum computer, what artificial intelligence algorithm could be accelerated and, and how would we do it? Um, there has been some proposals uh, that say that if you have quantum computer, certain algorithm of AI would be better. And as a result, it will save much more time to train and create a new AI model. So when you talk about the traveling salesman uh, problem, and we talk about the challenges that AI is trying to do with self-driving cars, you can imagine quantum computing and AI coming together to mm. build the, a city that is basically run on automated self-driving cars. Could potentially be. Anything that is complex and uh, requires uh, lots of energy to train AI, and that could be one arena that we should look into. And therefore, China is is zipping ahead. Uh, they have whole cities dedicated to, you know, self-driving arena. AI, yeah. It's interesting. It's not only just quantum helps AI. Maybe AI can help quantum do yeah. like error correction. People are looking into a clever way to manipulate this qubit so that it doesn't suffer so much from the coherence using AI, for example. Or even just from an engineering perspective, trying to figure out the best way to, to create those, uh, uh, milliseconds of, of calculations to be, so oh, what, did you, what did you say? To decrease decoherence, figure okay. out ways to decrease decoherence, right? To yeah. increase the decoherence time. So right. it takes longer um, for a system to become useless. Right. And so within 30 years, will, will you have a job? <laughs> <laughs> Interesting question. <laughs> And your answer is? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, you know, if you have a job that gives a, a little hope for the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's exciting to imagine the future, right? I mean, we never know. Uh, at, at some point in time, some corner of the world will come up with use a quantum computer and then people will start to be very serious. It is possible that 30 years from now, we have no idea what that world looks like. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, it, it was funny, like, uh, I look into how 20th century people were envisioned the 21st century, and uh, it was very far off, right? A <laughs> hundred years ahead, you never know what, what you can do. On that point, on that very, very optimistic point, we shall uh, call this uh, video interview to an end. Uh, Thank you very much for your time today. This was a fun conversation. It's very fun. Thanks a lot for having me. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.